So it is 606. We're going to get started here soon, as in right now. We'll let people get seated. It looks like everyone got uh, their name tag. And if you your organization had a binder over here, you have all the materials you need. If you got your name tag from here, hopefully you got uh, one of the green packets, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So does anyone need anything? Do you, okay. So you, you should have the stuff you need in here, if you got, yeah, okay. So with that, welcome everyone to the uh, Stationary Advisory Group meeting. Uh, my name's Lori Severino, I'm the Dear Don Program Manager for the City of San Jose, and I uh, run, facilitate the Stationary Advisory Group and run the Community Engagement Program for all things Dear Don. And so we also have our consultants here, Diana and Dave Javid, and there'll be some other city staff that are presenting tonight, so we'll introduce them along the way. So before I continue, I'd like to call the interpreter up, make an announcement. Buenas tardes, si alguien necesita algún intérprete de español, yo voy a estar aquí sentado, me avisan, por favor, gracias. So here is the agenda for tonight. So uh, after this introduction, I'll turn it over to Dave to approve the meeting minutes from the last time you all met together, which was August 22nd. Uh, we'll go over the meeting objectives, and then there's three big items for tonight, including an update on the community engagement process. Uh, that'll be a staff presentation by me, followed by a question and answer period. Next will be an update on the Google project or the Downtown West mixed use plan and we'll be talking about the processes related to the development agreement and design review, also followed by a Q&A. And then lastly will be an update by Liz Scanlon, the uh, project manager for the Deer Dawn Integrated Station concept plan. And also time for question and answers. And then at the end of the meeting there'll be an opportunity for public comment. So with this meeting, here are our objectives. Uh, we want you to know about all the engagement activities that we did last fall as part of the first round of outreach for this phase of work on Deer Dawn projects. So that'll include what we heard and what we're doing with the input, as well as some answers to a few commonly asked questions and the process moving forward through, through 2020. We want to make sure you understand of what's happened with the Deer Dawn Integrated Station concept plan since we last met and next steps in that process. And also clarify the process for developing a community benefits plan that will be part of a development agreement for the Google project, as well as uh, talk about the initial thinking for the design review process for that project. So tonight is your opportunity to ask questions, share reactions, and we also want to hear from the public. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Lori. Great to see you all again. Thank you for being here. Uh, so before we get kicked off here, I wanted to just get an approval of the meeting minutes from August 22nd. Can I get an approval in a second, please, from anyone? Motion to approve and submit it. Thank you. Second. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so with that, um, just wanted a, a quick reminder about meeting logistics. This is all recorded. It's actually also streaming live. All this information will be posted up on the project website along with summaries. Um, so please do know that and, and please do share your information and, and go to the website to um, visit all the great summaries and information that's been posted there to date. You all have seen these group agreements many times and you've all been excellent in staying within these group agreements. I just want to remind you that we want to create a safe space. We want to recognize that one pr person speaks at a time. We want to um, definitely put yourself in each other's shoes, in each other's perspectives. Um, you're, you're definitely representing different diverse voices in the community. Um, so we want to bring that to the table and, and really, again, just create a space where we could all think collectively and work together. And I always like to say, have fun. That's one of the main reasons we're all here as well. In terms of the public and your engagement with this process, um, there is a code of conduct, which we hope you all know by now, but it's really also to be respectful and hold your comments. We do have a public comment period, but we're also going to be collecting comment cards. We ask you to bring those up 
um, so that we know who all wants to speak. And we'll give you a couple warnings as we go throughout the process if you haven't had a chance to do so. Uh, and again, as we mentioned before, all this will be video, video recorded and the summaries will be posted to the website as well. So please stay tuned. And with that, I'm going to actually hand it back to Lori to do the community engagement update. I think I'm going to sit for this. <clears throat> OK. Thanks, Dave. All right, so as I mentioned, the purpose of this update is to explain what we did, what we heard, what we're doing with the input, and what's coming up with community engagement. So I had planned to co-present with Tim Rood. He is the planning division manager that's overseeing the Google project and the Deer Down Station area plan. Unfortunately, he's out sick today, so this is going to be all me. So sorry about that. <clears throat> So last fall, there was a couple uh, community events related to the Deer Dawn Integrated Station Concept Plan, including a couple workshops that were focused on the big moves of that. And you'll hear a little bit more on that uh, later on in the meeting. There was also a virtual town hall, which is a somewhat experimental engagement format that we all tried. And it, we thought it went very well. About uh, 70 plus people were tuned in live and then of course it's posted afterwards and so we've gotten more views on that. Uh, for the Google project, there was a couple meetings that the planning division hosted, uh, an environmental scoping meeting as well as a development application meeting. And uh, Google also hosted a design workshop on December 7th. So for the Deardon Station Area Program, so that covers not just the Google project and the concept plan, but all the other things going on in the area, we held two community meetings at uh, the Leninger Center and the Gardner Community Center, and three small group meetings with you all. And I, I believe most of uh, your organizations were able to send a representative to one of these three meetings. So these are the discussion topics that we talked about at the uh, fall engagement meetings. And the purpose of those meetings were really to inform people about what's going on, the projects and the decision making processes, as well as get reactions to some initial concepts on, under consideration. So that includes uh, Google's application for the Downtown West Mixed Use Plan, as well as staff's recommended concept layout for the uh, station concept plan. So we also had tables and discussion topics related to the Deardon Station Area Plan amendment process, transportation and parking, parks, trails, and open space, and housing. So this is a picture of the uh, first community meeting we had where there were tables for each of these six topics. And so this format allowed people to explore the information at their own pace, stay at some tables longer than others, depending on their interest. And we had the project managers for these projects available to interact with the public and answer questions. So experimenting with a little bit different format, um, but it was a, a really great way to share a lot of information and let people absorb it at their own uh, pace and interest. So at uh, all these meetings, um, this is just a quick refresher since most of you already saw this presentation, but uh, we did provide an overview of all the projects in the Deardon station area that are active. So of course there's uh, many adopted plans and things like that that apply to the area, but these are the ones that have a, a ongoing uh, component to it. Uh, so this was just mainly to provide um, a foundational concept for the rest of the, the presentation. We use this map uh, to show how all these projects fit together in space. I had a big board of this printed out. And there's extra copies of this up here if you uh, want to get that at any point. <coughs> And so we also uh, presented this graphic to show how the projects fit together in time and with the engagement process. So the, the intent here is to be well coordinated across projects and to focus our outreach and engagement into four rounds. And so we've, of course, completed 
the fall round, and so we have three more planned for 2020. <coughs> so we'll get into that preview a little bit later on. Um, so the, these next few slides summarize the most frequently made comments that we heard at these meetings and the key themes from, from the fall engagement. So with respect to the Google project, uh, there's a desire for more information related to housing, the active retail cultural spaces, the relationship with the surrounding neighborhoods, building design, parking, construction phasing, open space, and its relationship with the uh, concept plan. So in, also uh, on the Google project, there were comments to make sure that there is a sufficient usable open space and recreational facilities as part of the overall open space plan, uh, that we should highlight the green infrastructure and sustainability efforts that have been proposed as part of the Google project. And a few people thought that the interface with the station and the projects need, uh, the project needs more of a wow factor. And these were the top topics raised as part of the environmental scoping process for the Google project. So economic and social effects, uh, emergency access, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and historic and biological resources. So related to the Deardon Station Area Plan update, there were some suggestions to expand the study area boundaries, concerns about the potential effects of increased height limits, a desire for other development beyond Google to be held to the same high standards, and questions about the anticipated development capacity and the projected community needs that would result from new development. So in addition to the uh, comments on the Google project already mentioned, uh, with respect to parks and public spaces, there's a desire to uh, address the issues with homeless people along the creeks, and to, uh, to treat Guadalupe River Park as more of a focal point in the area. So I'm just to touch on this at a super high level, since this is a agenda item later on, uh, in terms of what we heard on the concept plan, there was general support for staff's recommendation to move forward with elevated platforms at the station and to have two concourses, one at uh, Santa Clara, one at San Fernando. There are concerns, though, about the third recommendation to uh, add tracks and trains to the existing corridor, uh, specifically to the south. Uh, there was also some concerns about the potential impacts to the taming area from a viaduct option. So these are some of the topics that people want the project team to address uh, as work continues on the project. Uh, there was a lot of interest uh, in how the historic depot building will be treated. That was probably the top comment. Um, there's also interest in how the station will interface with the neighborhoods and, and the tracks uh, effect on the neighborhoods as well. So a lot of topics still to be analyzed and addressed in detail. <clears throat> so some additional themes related to transportation are uh, improving pedestrian and bicycle safety, parking management, uh, specifically recognizing that uh, there's long-term goals for the area and also current demands for parking, so a desire to, to balance that. Uh, also to minimize effects on the neighborhood and arena with respect to parking. So there's a suggestion to uh, look beyond the Deardon area to the west at the Cahill area and traffic concerns. So neighbors want to make sure that the city is considering and addressing the transportation effects from the station and new development on streets outside of the plan boundaries. And this is related to the Deardon station area plan, but also the downtown transportation plan that's uh, kicking off now. So this, uh, these are some of the key themes that came from the small group discussions with you all uh, related to housing. Um, so there were calls for 
a bold approach and to make this area a model for inclusive development and to develop strategies that get the biggest bang for the buck. There's recognition of trade-offs involved and a desire for balance. So for example, build both affordable housing that is integrated with market rate as well as in standalone buildings. Consider the full range of affordability as well as the overall number of units being proposed. And balance units, affordable units in the downtown with other parts of the city, especially considering opportunities for housing around other train stations that are connected to Deardon. So these are some of the key themes that came up at the community meetings. <coughs> Sorry. Um, people continue to raise concerns about displacement and want more outreach to people that are affected by displacement. Uh, they want housing for all. And some people shared some ideas for large employers and developers and their role in uh, funding housing construction and programs. People are also thank you, uh, raising concerns about homelessness. Uh, so these probably all sound a little familiar from all the engagement we've done, but the, these are what are on top of people's mind for uh, this, this past fall, or at least the people that participated in our engagement events. So here are some commonly asked questions that we got during the engagement rounds. Uh, the first one is how can the public and SOG participate in the community benefit process? And so we have put on the agenda for this meeting to dive into that a little bit more. So I won't get into that answer now. Uh, a very common question is what is going to happen to the historic train station uh, based on the um, staff recommended concept layout. So the, the sh somewhat short answer to that is we do not know exactly what will happen to it at this point, but to meet the planned transit capacity for the corridor, the tracks and platforms within the station will most likely be widened which would impact the, the existing building. So it is a designated historic resource, so any modification or alteration would need to be conducted in compliance with the National Pre Historic Preservation Act. So in the next phases of work, the project team will look into the options for relocation, preservation, adaptive reuse, integration with the station, all of those ideas. Uh, they will also analyze the impacts and mitigation during the environmental review phase. So the third question shown here is how the city, how is the city addressing the potential for small business displacement? And so the uh, sh short answer on that one is we are doing an assessment of the small business context and the potential displacement risk. We're learning from the initial work being done in the Alum Rock Corridor as part of the citywide strategy for small business uh, anti-displacement. And we're, we will ultimately be recommending policies for the Deer Dawn area. So this will likely involve increasing outreach to existing businesses and to expand awareness of existing resources such as the business owner space. So we said this in at least one of the small group meetings, but if you are hearing of a business that is struggling or concerned about displacement, please refer them to the Office of Economic Development. We will try to connect them with uh, assistance. So the <coughs> last bullet here is what is the relationship between the Deardon Station Area Plan and the Google Project with respect to CEQA and wondering if they were gonna be covered under the same report or not and things like that. So just to be clear, each of these uh, projects will have their own CEQA document. The target for releasing the environmental impact report on the Google project is uh, this spring, but the team uh, still needs to advance the project description for the update to the Deardon Station area plan before deciding what level of review is needed. And so that document will likely come out a little bit later. All right, so what are we doing with all this input? So this is a very high level summary of, you can all imagine how this is probably oversimplifying all of it, but just so you know, um, 
with respect to the Google project, we have requested additional information, most of which listed earlier the things that the public wants to know more about. So do we. So we've requested that information. Uh, we're working with them to address the comments through the development and environmental review process. We're in, in analyzing all of the environmental effects that are acquired under CEQA, uh, including historic resources, uh, population and housing, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we are developing design standards and guidelines for the project, which you will hear more about uh, on the next agenda item. So for the Deardown Station Area Plan amendments, we are considering the comments that we heard uh, when developing the recommended changes to the plan. And so that includes those related to parks and open space, as well as height and development standards. Uh, we are working on the potential development capacity for the plan, and we'll analyze the implications of that on public infrastructure and services. So with respect to housing, uh, there's a few places where we're directly addressing that. So for the affordable housing implementation plan, we're developing and analyzing uh, affordable housing construction, preservation, as well as resident protection. So the housing department calls that the three Ps. Uh, we're also coordinating with citywide efforts, so sp specifically the anti-displacement strategies for residents and small businesses uh, to address some of these big issues. And we're working towards a commercial linkage fee as well. So with transportation, there's uh, a few different ways in which we are addressing this. So first, we're prioritizing pedestrian and bicycle safety in the plans and project review. We're studying parking and developing policies with the goal of balancing current and future demands, analyzing traffic effects. And for the uh, downtown transportation plan, the, the plan right now is to focus first on the Deardon area. And that plan is, is covering the priority development area for the downtown, and it's tied to grant funding. So the boundaries of that are, we're not proposing to change, but rather we are going to make sure that the effects outside of those official study area boundaries are, are addressed. So just because something's not in it doesn't mean it's not being considered. It's just there's a technical grant requirement um, on the downtown transportation plan related to the boundaries. So in terms of engagement, we are updating the uh, continually updating the website with information. We'll be updating the FAQs uh, that are on the website now and beginning to prepare materials for the next outreach round, keeping in mind the common questions and comments that we uh, are hearing. And we're also continuing to think of new ways in which we can engage residents and small businesses uh, more effectively. And so one of those ways is we s established a grant program, small grants, but to compensate community-based organizations that are partnering with us to expand our outreach capacity and to develop more creative ways and with the ultimate goal of reaching a broader range of community members. So these are the seven uh, plus organizations that um, we're working with right now to, to get that partnership going. All right, so continuing the preview of the year ahead, uh, mentioned that we've already completed the fall round and we have three more coming up. And so these roughly correspond to seasons, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, the next one, the spring round, is going to be very important for getting feedback as the opportunities to influence projects gets narrower as you get closer and closer to the uh, decision points. So. Uh, with the spring round, the, the Google project, as I mentioned, will have a draft EIR, environmental impact report released. There'll be some draft pri uh, design priorities to respond to. And then for the Deardown Station area, wide work, uh, there'll be draft concepts to respond to as well. 
And so there's a city council study session. I apologize, the lighting is not great in here, but kind of for both the uh, Google in green and the Deer Dawn Station area in orange, there'll be a joint study session uh, on April 24th is when that's been scheduled. So with all of this in mind, knowing kind of how the flow and timing of these projects have been coordinated, we have uh, set the dates for the next three stationary advisory group meetings, um, largely based on when rooms are available, to be honest, but we want to also, of course, put these during the times in which uh, your input will be meaningful to the process. So the, um, the next one we're looking at March 18th, and the idea right now for that meeting is to do topic-based topic-based presentations and discussions related to all the projects. So focusing on land use and urban design, parks, trails, and open space, transportation and parking, housing and displacement, and green building and sustainability. We're also planning to do an update on the Google development agreement and have a discussion related to community benefit trade-offs and priorities. So after that, we're looking at June 17 and August 10. And I know most of you are listening because you're writing it down, so that's awesome. Um, the idea for the June meeting would be to uh, focus on the draft plans for the Deardon area. So the intention is to, at that point, have an amended Deardon station area plan, a draft affordable housing implementation plan, a draft parking study ready for public reaction. Uh, but also planning to do updates on the different components for the Google project. And then in August, uh, specifically August 10th, uh, the tentative agenda would be to uh, give updates related to the draft design standards and guidelines and draft development agreement for the Google project, and then also updates on the area-wide work. So of course, the farther out we get, the harder it is to be more specific about that, but this is the tempo that we're, we're planning for. So lots of information, but uh, yeah, I'll open it up now to questions and comments, and have Dave help facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier as well, in terms of logistics, you all probably noticed, but the restrooms are right outside that door, and I want to welcome you all to help yourself to food. There's great food here and plenty of it. Um, so as we used to do in the past, uh, if you have a comment or question, please turn your name tags or name cards perpendicular, and I'll call on you, and we'll hopefully hear from all of you. So any questions on what you just heard or general comments? Lori totally nailed it. Okay, Jeffrey. Yeah, um, uh, Jeffrey, <coughs> excuse me. Jeffrey Buchanan with Working Partnerships. Um, so one of the the item, I appreciated the presentation and, and good to see a lot of the feedback around the housing displacement plan. Uh, I think it was it was pretty well summarized. Um, but a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, uh, you noted there was questions about the kind of limited term uh, corporate accommodations. One question I have um, that particular part of the proposal I think came before the scope of the um, commercial linkage fee move forward or any of our changes to uh, our inclusionary housing policy uh, would be interesting to hear uh, how how uh, uh, office of economic development is thinking about uh, what you know is that housing is that more like a hotel use so it's a commercial use so it, initial thoughts on that and then secondly it doesn't look like in this plan we're seeing the uh, the district financing plan and the kind of uh, uh, when that, when we'll see the updates on that, um, uh, was hoping to, that would be part of the conversation around financing and housing, but certainly financing and the DISC, financing and other amenities in the district. Um, interested to hear the plans on that. Um, so, the, I, we're, we're taking those questions and I, in terms of how the limited term corporate accommodations will be treated, I think that's still being worked out. And whether it's housing or commercial or some hybrid, uh, there's, our code isn't super clear on that. So um, that's the extent to which I know that. <laughs> and then uh, the commercial linkage fee, I guess that would, 
similarly, we would need to define it more clearly to see how that applies, but is that? I think you just raised a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but we will yeah. dive into that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, on the, the district the district, f the district financing plan, um, I think what we've realized is that that's going to take longer than this year, 2020, that what we can have by the end of the year is sort of a sense of what the financing strategy would be in terms of different tools that might be needed for the shared infrastructure because it's a timing question until we know exactly what the project that approved is and what the mitigations are and really what the infrastructure needs are going to be that that Google's not going to pay for itself but are essentially going to be shared infrastructure um, we can't really develop the financing plan. So once we have a sense of what the shared infrastructure is, then we need to do like an engineering and a cost study on that to know what it costs and we'll think about the financing tools. So, so that one is probably more of a two-year effort. We got a first cut at it in 2020 at a strategy level, but the specific financing plan will need to come once we know what the infrastructure needs are. Okay, thank you very much. Who is next? Kathy. Please remember, thank you, Jeffrey, for setting the pace, but remind everyone your name and organization, too. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Sutherland, and I'm from the Delmas Park neighborhood. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you talked about the traffic study that is being funded by the grant being limited as to what you could look at, what I'd like to know is how you're going to incorporate the um, impacts to the areas west of Google if you're only limited to looking at a certain area, how are you going to make any kind of traffic study complete rather than fragmented? Yeah, sorry if I um, wasn't as clear on that. So the intent is to look at areas beyond it. It's just in terms of having the technical boundary be, it has to correspond to the priority development area. Um, so I'll, if anyone from DOT wants to um, respond in more detail on that. Um, and so it sounds like the work is not going to be um, determined by the grant. The work is going to be determined by impacts and then the, the report. Yeah, so I'm just a little confused. Yeah, and I will we'll get more clarity on that and get you a more complete answer from okay. DOT. I don't want to speak beyond that, but I know the intent is to consider the effects and knowing that plan boundaries are pretty arbitrary, mm -hmm. uh, especially with transportation, there is a lot, and so we are very sensitive, especially to the Plant 51, Cahill area with the station changes, and the intent is yeah. to create more permeability, but then wanting to be thoughtful about what are the implications of that, the good, the bad, and everything in between, so. Thank we'll you. get back to you on a more detailed response. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yes, you're next. Give me your mic. Oh, thanks. <coughs> David Meyer from Silicon Valley at Home. Um, I guess I first want to say thanks. I, I talked to Lori and Dave at a couple of these community meetings, and I just think it's impressive how much information you try to cram into those meetings and how much you try to convey to the public. And it's. It is really impressive, and it's a lot of information and a lot of intersecting things, so I think that's great. Um, one thing that I, that I would say is I think that the main barrier and challenge, I think, to myself as a SAG member, and I think some other members in this uh, committee may agree, and I think also to the public, still remains that we still don't have a good idea of what the capacity, overall capacity goals that we're aiming for as part of the whole station area. We have an idea of what Google is looking at. We have some more details from them, and that's great. It's easy to... We can, we can kind of play around and, and think about that a little bit more in depth, but because we still don't really have a sense of what's the overall goal, how much housing are we really trying to create in the station area overall beyond Google, how many jobs are we hoping to create beyond Google, it makes it very difficult, I think, for us to give good input in terms of the housing strategy, in terms of <coughs> kind of a lot of the, the other pieces of the plan. So I guess my question is, at what point is the city hoping to actually be putting forward some ideas of actual capacity so that we can start to better engage on issues like the affordable housing piece, yeah. parks, pretty much all, all of the pieces. It's, it's, it's 
hard, kind of hard. We're in a pretty, still in a pretty abstract mode, I feel. Yes, I, I appreciate the frustration because I know there's a lot of excitement around the question of how much additional housing and commercial and other development could we have in the Deer Don Station area? And I, I just, because I just sat down here, just I'm Kim Wallish, I'm the Deputy City Manager and Economic Development Director, and I'm here also with Rosalind Huey, who's our Director of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. So we are actively working on that um, assessment. Our planning staff, the team that, that, that Tim Root is leading, in conjunction with SOM. And March 18th, come back. That will be the meeting where we sh will share our initial assessment. But I can say it's looking very positive that for a variety of factors that we could have significantly more capacity for development in the station area than we had envisioned when the plan was adopted originally in 2014. Stay tuned, come back. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. So one of the things that I... Harvey, remind everyone who you are. I'm sorry? Name. Remind everyone who you are. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Harvey Darnell, North Wilga Neighborhood Association, and all things Dear Don. Um, one of the things that I talked about earlier in earlier iterations uh, was displacement of, of people because of the gentrification. And our neighborhoods, the, both the Gardner, uh, North Willow Glen, and the Gregory Plaza neighborhoods being the closest neighborhoods in on the other side of the freeway and still less than half a mile away. And I was talking about uh, issues of gentrification and, and the prices going up, et cetera, et cetera, and people being displaced because of that. Well, it's now occurring to me that the impact of Airbnb for temporary housing for people that are visiting or working for short-term uh, projects for Google and all the other uh, businesses that will be settling there could also create some issues. And I think we ha might have an example where we could study, we could look at the uh, Apple spaceship when they plopped it down in the middle of that neighborhood and see what the effect is and how much of that the surrounding neighborhoods got uh, Airbnb'd and created displacement. So I think that's something that we should really look at carefully. Yes, I, I agree. And just so you're aware, a number of years ago, the city put in place an Airbnb ordinance um, or short-term rental ordinance, uh, which does constrain the number of days that uh, homeowners can Airbnb their home and requires them to be in the home and it has various constraints on it. Unfortunately, uh, that is not being uh, uh, enforced very well throughout the city because I have a a dear friend who is on uh, uh, his board uh, for his condo association, a fairly large one, and they're constantly fighting and they're constantly having to try, try to identify the places that are airbnb -ed. And there's nowhere within the city that is really going through and monitoring that at this point. Great, thank you, Harvey. So any other questions or comments on the engagement plan or what we've heard thus far? Yes. So I'm Kiyomi with Greenbelt Alliance, um, and the answer might be wait till March 18th, but um, I, I wanted to know, um, I, I saw on your slide that you're considering comments on the parks, open space, and trails, and um, I'm thinking that when you do your analysis of the potential capacity for this plan, that would have an impact on, you know, what the potential, you know, for those, those amenities would be. Um, can you speak a little bit more to the process of how you... Are, are doing this analysis or, you know, what the thinking is around that? Hello, I'm Rosalind Huey, uh, as Kim introduced me, uh, Director of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. 
So um, the issue of parks and open spaces and connectivity, um, we are considering that as part of the amendment to the Deridon Station Area Plan. Mm -hmm. And we're currently working very closely with staff in Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services in terms of building from what's currently in the DSAP and figuring out with Google's proposal, and as we just discussed previously, the additional development capacity, um, what the needs are going to be uh, around parks and open spaces. Uh, and yes, stay tuned, because that'll be a part of the information, our initial findings that we'll present in March. Great, thank you. Kevin. Good evening, Kevin Christman, Gardner Neighborhood Association. Um, as we come along here in all this development process, like we say, and we have all this increased capacity, um, what has the city been doing or what will the city do uh, with like an emergency plan for like natural disasters like say earthquakes? And uh, also, you know, technically even with the flood uh, improvements that have been made uh, to the Guadalupe River, um, Gar much of Gardner is still in a 100-year flood zone, which I'm not sure whether that's really the case now or not. But, uh, you know, so earthquakes and floods. And also, what is the plan for um, additional fire stations or um, funding the fire department so that they can actually uh, access uh, fires in some of these higher-rise buildings that we're going to be bringing in now that we have... Uh, building height increases uh, uh, because of the uh, one engine un inoperable uh, limits of being lifted. I mean, yeah, to, to part of the answer is the impact on public services like fire services and police services is part of the environmental analysis. Um, and, you know, in building review and the development review, the, the fire department uh, is, an, you know, an integral part of the development services team. Uh, Nancy Klein has joined us, and Nancy is a director of real estate and assistant director of economic development. She has a lot of experience in this area, so I'm going to pass the mic to her. Thank you very much. just wanted to add into the good comments that Kim made. There's a both and, so through Measure T, there are uh, fire stations that are being added, some of which will already be adding capacity to the downtown. And as Kim mentioned through the environmental, there will be, as we answer the questions about what the overall capacity, what is the need, and where do we need to place those additional resources in order to serve appropriately for the safety of the community. Okay, great, thank you. Michael. Michael Eckhart with uh, Down Street Tennis Association and also Second Street Voices. I'm wondering about, I saw on your slides, but it was briefly brushed over. Right now, the downtown or the Deardown Station area is a big area for the homeless, and they do make their home right there. And we talk about displacement. What are we doing for them? What are we doing for the homeless and the low, low income, the very low income? I haven't seen anything that you know pertains to that at all in any of the plans. So, so there, Rosen and I were just saying there's a tremendous amount that's being done on the affordable housing plan. You're already seeing affordable and supportive housing pro projects that are being opened in the downtown. I think three recently by Spartan Keys and two others on the um, central and um, moving, moving north. So more of that is being provided. We're also working on locations for bridge housing that you, you have already heard about, and we're certainly looking for others. We know it's a tremendous problem, and we continue to look for how we make sure we're making a dent in that. Thank you very much. I don't see any other nameplates turned, so I'll assume that we're all set with this section of the presentation, and we'll transition now to an update on the Google Downtown Mixed Use Plan by Kim Rosalind and Nancy. Yes. So first of all, I didn't get to say Happy New Year. Um, 
Welcome <coughs> to, to, very good to see you. Yeah, and uh, Nancy Klein. Uh, closer, to the closer, thank you. Nancy Klein, okay. I get to do a couple of amazing things at the city. I'm the director of real estate and I get to work with Kim as the assistant director of economic development. And I'm really happy to be uh, beginning to be able to share and discuss with you how we go about the development agreement as well as included within that is the community benefits plan. And, and as noted on the slide, the MOU, which was approved in 2018 with Google, provides an excellent starting point for negotiating a future development agreement. Uh, the development agreement uh, for those people, and for most of us who don't work with these on a regular basis, is intended to provide certainty for both the community and for the applicant, in this case Google, about the rules, regulations, and responsibilities that govern the future development. And a development agreement is a very common tool used in a lot of cities for large long-term projects. The MOU outlines that the development agreement will include vested project approvals, and pardon the jargon, but that's what's called vested. So the idea is the things that will be included in the development agreement and won't change over the life of that agreement. Whereas normally the council can make changes any given Tuesday, they sit down, there is a sense of stability and certainty to allow the development to proceed. And it would hold things like you see just, there'll be more, but just brief examples like traffic capacity, design guidelines, the affordable housing plan, others are densities in general, maximum square footages, heights, those kinds of things can be quote unquote vested rights. That's the jargon, the term of art. And the community benefits plan, which will definitely be a part of this development agreement, will implement an allocation of funds for community benefits by category. And the category, the conversation that has been a lot and we will be working together over the next year plus to solidify things that you already know about and they'll also come up again in the presentation, affordable housing, displacement, jobs, historic preservation, art, the other things that have come directly from SAG as well as other community input. The other portions of the community benefit plan will identify the timing, phasing for community benefits so that the community will know specifically and be able to call, uh, hold Google and the city accountable for delivery of the community benefits. <clears throat> I wanted to, to include the language from the MOU itself, and I understand that you, you have the MOU in your packet of materials, in your binders, to remind you that on page seven to eight, this is a little bit of an encapsulation, that the way we'll figure out values here is that the city would expect Google to share a portion of the value created by city council actions with the city through a community benefits plan. And there will be, there's a couple places where we notice this, that you all know, and the broader community will continue to learn from you, the changes that the city will make to the Deardown Station Area Plan that include more capacity, different land use areas and changes, increased heights or densities, parking policy changes, at the certainty of a, of a development agreement. We will calculate and review with you the, the homework on how those translate into value and that the Google will share back a portion and I don't have a specific number for you now but we'll look to other DAs and other communities and what's appropriate for our community. They'll share that back with San Jose so that those dollars will be attributed to the community benefits as identified through SOG and other community input. What we were also careful to do, and Google is, is clearly a participant <coughs> in the MOU and understands the, that the, the following costs won't be included. They can't be included in the dollars for community benefits. Uh, costs for mitigation impacts under CEQA or costs for project design, 
other project elements, um, project components that, that are proposed by Google that aren't necessarily the, the uh, desire or uh, emphasis of the city and the community. Costs incurred to meet city standard requirements like parks fees or a for baseline affordable housing fees. Conditions of approval fees or taxes. None of that will be allocated to community benefits. The next slide, Kim will go over. So we thought it was important to define some key terms because we've been talking about community benefits, um, some other places and other people talk about public benefits. So we put together this framework and thought we would spend a, a little time on it. And it relates to the information Nancy just provided because we're trying to get at what really is this space for pure community benefits that are really are related to the development agreement. So it's the existence of the development agreement under California law that allows a community to ask for community benefits in return for the development agreement. So, but it occurred to us that benefits to the public from the project actually come from three different sources. And there's value um, very early on in the negotiation, because we, we, we are just starting now, in, in, so, in sorting through this. So the circle on the left is the things that Google will be required to do. And these are baseline city requirements, the kind of requirements that we would require of any development or any similar development in the city. So things that come to mind are the parks, PDO, PIO requirement, right? That's in our code. It's very specific what the requirement is. There's <laughs> flexibility in how you meet the requirement, but you must meet this requirement. Another example would be the inclusionary housing requirement. You need to meet that requirement. We're likely to put a commercial impact fee in place. You need to meet, pay the commercial impact fee. As Nancy said, we have parking requirements. So those kinds of things that are basic city requirements, and we've been clear all along in, a, in the MOU that if they're basic city requirements, Google will be expected to meet them like everybody else. There also will be project mitigation. So after we see the results of the environmental analysis, there may be some specific requirements, some mitigation requirements of Google to address the impact that the project it has. So typically, you may have some requirements related to transportation or infrastructure or habitat or public safety, public services. Um, but those won't be known for a few more months until we see that draft um, um, environmental impact report. But you see what I'm trying to say, that the circle there are like requirements, things that Google has to do. On the bottom there, and, and my point is that benefits to the public will come from some of those things, right? We will get improved trails, we will get parks, we will get uh, money for affordable housing, we will get bike lanes, so some of the things will come just from the city requirements. Or we will experience those as benefits to the public. The bottom circle there, the, the Google project itself will have features that will be positive for our community. But those, those are things that Google is deciding on their own that they want to do. It's sort of voluntary, it's at their discretion. The biggest one that comes to mind right now is district, uh, district utility systems and uh, the very, very high environmental sustainability standards and initiatives that Google is going to do. The city thinks this is great, but we're not requiring to Google to do this. They're, they're going to do it because that's just the kind of company they are. They want to set a high bar there. But we'll clearly benefit as a community that they're doing that. It will be, help us meet our climate smart goals and it'll uh, clearly be beneficial to um, our environment. So the third circle there, these are the things when we say community benefits, these are the, the benefits that we will negotiate, that they're not the baseline requirements, they're not the environmental mitigations, they're not things that Google is doing voluntarily on their own. So this is where all of the input, the extensive input that we have gotten the last year and a half and we will be drilling down more with some uh, additional questions for you at the March meeting. 
this is where those things start to come into play. Things like additional affordable housing over and above uh, or deeper than the city requirements. Uh, workforce development investment. Um, investment in the things that you, that you potentially you mentioned, in homelessness or protect, protection, preservation, anti-displacement. Maybe there are cultural spaces or library spaces or things that we mutually decide, uh, childcare, like that are priorities um, that could be a community benefit. Or at times, um, if they're going to enhance a basic city requirement or advance it, deliver it much early, earlier than they typically would, those kinds of things can be considered community benefits. So we just wanted to um, share this with you because quite frankly, it took us a while to, to sort this out and it's really important to make sure that we're standardized on the terminology that we're using in our community for this. So back to you, Nancy. Thank you, Kim. So on the next slide, Rosalind, no, there you go. <laughs> the next slide, one more. There, there's a brief listing of the of the uh, the the list of affordable housing, education, workforce, small business opportunities. These are things we've heard very deeply from you, and we'll keep listening and keep making greater distinctions. And what's the most important to the community? Um, and then we also wanted to make sure we were including, again, directly from the MOU, the uh, city's ex expectation of community benefit, and we went over this a little bit, would be, be premised on, among other factors, the additional value that Google receives from the legislative acts that the community and the city council takes. And that's where I went through that list of changes to the DA, general plan amendments, parking changes, et cetera. These will enhance the value uh, and also, very importantly, the value of the certainty of a development agreement. These will provide the base for estimating the value the created, uh, that would be created, plus it will uh, take into account the residual value or the price of the land that Google paid for. Lastly, in the MOU, and as you already have, we, we take into account the financial viability of the project as a consideration moving forward. Lastly, the consideration for ongoing direction and engagement, the council has been very clear, will uh, consider previous and subsequent input provided by the SOG, the general public, key stakeholders, and the city council when developing the community benefits plan. And that input will continue at, through the rounds of the honeycombed input that Lori shared with you earlier. And we'll get the input on the amount and use of community benefit funds. And we'll provide periodic and specific reports to this body uh, including the opportunity to review and provide in a public forum on a final community benefits and development agreement. And Larry, Lori shared a little bit of the schedule for that. And one more uh, highlight of the timing is that in spring, we want to bring to you some community benefit trade-offs that we're working on now and we'll bring to you. So you can give us direct input on what's most important. And in summer, there'll be additional status and feedback. And in the fall, we'll be bringing to you the final draft of the development agreement. And with that, I will turn this over to the very capable Rosalind Huey. So last fall, um, as you all know, Google submitted its mixed-use development plan, um, and that application did not include specific building designs, and we heard from, from residents and stakeholders and 
for members of the SOG that you were very much interested um, in seeing this information. So this evening we wanted to provide you with our current thinking around how the city intends to review the building designs. So we are considering an approach that is very similar to our typical process for large development projects, but it's different in some ways due to its size uh, and the duration of the build out and the context. So we're talking about 80 acres uh, of land, a very large development with um, a 10 year uh, minimum uh, build out time. So we're it's a very large project and it's going to be built out over several years. So first I want to review Google's uh, current planning applications and as you're probably aware, it includes a plan development zoning. And this is a customized zoning district that establishes land uses and zoning development standards such as maximum heights, parking requirements and development capacity. It also includes a planned development permit. Uh, before I go to that, I, I should say that um, the planned development zoning district um, is often chosen by developers who do very large projects. Um, and our city staff, we actually process planned development zonings uh, all across the city. So it's, it's not a new uh, zoning district. So then secondly, is the plan development permit. Um, and the plan development permit actually implements the plan development zoning and it includes uh, an additional level of detail such as ground floor uses, landscaping, circulation, uh, more details on bu building heights, bulk and size, and architectural detail. So for the Google project, the plan development permit will include a very detailed set of design standards and guidelines. Uh, so very specific items uh, that would include building massing, um, materials, types of, of materials, colors, ground floor design, um, transit access, view corridors, pedestrian and bicycle connectivity, um, there will be specifics on even lighting and signage and building facade uh, and of course specifics on the public realm. So following the entitlement phase, the city would use <coughs> these design standards and guidelines that are included in the plan development permit to conduct design review of the individual buildings. Specifically, Google would submit an application to the planning division that would include the site plans and designs for individual buildings or phases. Then staff would review the application for completeness and for compliance with the plan development zoning and the plan development permit as well as the general plan. Staff would then prepare a, a staff report um, and we would hold a public hearing to present the building designs, uh, staff's analysis, and we would also take public comments. Um, so before I get to this side, so this, this process uh, and the approach that we're thinking about, um, we think it would allow us to develop very specific standards and guidelines for how each individual building will look and function and relate to its surroundings. And this really does build upon uh, the work in the downtown design standards and guidelines as well as the amended uh, Deridon Station area plan. Uh, and also we think this approach will also allow for some flexibility and creativity um, over the multi-year build out. Um, so there, uh, this process and approach uh, is not new. Um, there are very, uh, there are other examples actually across the state um, that have been successful such as Pier 70 uh, in San Francisco, Mission Rock also in San Francisco, uh, and North Hollywood in Los Angeles. 
So given that the design standards and guidelines document is intended to guide building and site design over the life of the entitlements, this year is very an important time to get uh, public input on the design. So Google is hosting a series of community workshops to get input on public spaces and building design as they develop their initial draft. And the next workshop will be held on January 25th, uh, 1 to 4.30 p.m. Um, at, South Autumn, at 20 South Autumn Street, and there'll be two sessions. And for those of you who are interested in attending this workshop, we have the email address here that you can respond to. Yes, so once Google submits the draft design standards and guidelines to the planning division, we will also conduct a thorough review in co coordination with the other Dear Don area work uh, and con conduct additional outreach. So throughout the process, we will show progress with the members of the SAG um, and as well as the public as part of the planned rounds of outreach and community engagement. Uh, and we, are, uh, we have tentative topics uh, for the spring round, which is design priorities. Uh, in the summer, um, we would provide a progress update uh, and then fall of this year, we will have the draft design standards and guidelines document. Great. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so before I forget, we're going to have one more presentation, then it's going to be public comment time. So if you have had, had a chance to turn in a comment card, please do. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you all as the SOG to ask any questions, comments. We'll start with Nadia. Nadia Aziz with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, I have some questions about the timeline of negotiation. Like when, when has that started? When does that start? And I'm assuming it's OED that's negotiating um, the benefits. Um, and uh, in addition, aside from the SOG, are you going to be asking any feedback about the community dev development plan from like any other community input? Like I understand that you're doing community outreach to get um, to understand what to put into that, but like post um, developing a community benefits or thinking through community benefits, are you um, going to be doing any other community outreach or in input aside from SOG? All great questions. <clears throat> so as Kim mentioned, we are, we are in a place now that we have the development plan in and are going through the analysis that we're able to start the discussion. And honestly, we still have some questions about what the plan is or isn't, or, um, you know, it, for example, it all identifies the FAA height univer uh, uniformly, and we know all the buildings won't go up. So under just understanding as much as we can. So, so in beginning that conversation, we've already uh, committed that there will be uh, additional groups in addition to, to the SAG that want to hear about what's going on. I don't know exactly what those will be, but that opportunities for input will we'll, we'll consider or will work together as the time proceeds. And Nadia, if I missed something else there, I apologize. Did I miss something else that you referenced? Um, I think it was who's doing the negotiation. Ah. So um, this, is, this is important. It's a very, uh, the core team will, will be um, Office of Economic Development, and we have some really good uh, uh, consultants who are working with us who have broad experience in other places, not only in California, but in the nation, um, so that we wanted to make sure we were well prepared. We're also very mindful of having our city department partners um, because we want uh, to make sure the baseline is understood and that the community be benefits, as Kim described in the public benefits, community benefits circles, go beyond. So we want to make sure we're understanding that set of distinctions um, and that the cu community benefits reflect what we're hearing from the community and it is beyond the baseline. So they're an appropriate components of the negotiation, there will be key uh, partners in the departments who, like the affordable housing plan is a great one, will be including Jackie and her staff. And 
uh, to respond to the outreach piece, the intent is that the SOG meetings in March, June, August would kick off an outreach round and the materials we develop for SOG, we would roll into the community meetings and the other types of events we do, so hopefully some online engagement. So we'll develop a toolkit of engagement. So that would include the any feedback we're seeking on community benefits that will be uh, offered to the com general public for feedback as well. Thank you, we'll go to Kathy and then to Harvey. Thank you very much, Kathy Sutherland from Delmas Park. I had a couple of different questions. One of them is regarding the vested benefits. How do you determine what is a vested benefit and has the city used this term before? All the time. Okay. So one of them that's public that you might want to look up, um, when we did the Hitachi Western Digital, mm -hmm. which was some, we talk about it as our first horizontal urban village okay. that had uh, enhanced affordability, housing affordability requirements and vested elements. <coughs> it, it, it's very, very common. It's part of every development agreement. And it, it, it's just the basis of what, what do, do both parties, the community and the applicant, understand will be hold steady over the term, the life of the development agreement. Okay, thank you. And then the other one is you talk about um, increasing density and value capture, and I hear it referring only to Google. What about the other parcels that are within the, the area that are receiving the same benefit? What is the um, obligation going to be for them? Th that's a great question. Um, the de having a development agreement and certainty is the tool, the mechanism that allows the city to receive or extract, if you will, um, community benefits. Not all projects will have community will have community benefits. Um, um, and one of the other or another set of tools when the question came about um, financing, there may well be community facilities dr districts, CFDs, or you've heard of enhanced infrastructure districts, um, EIFDs that contribute. Those would have to be a part of a broader set of properties. Yes, and let me also add that um, last December, or, or last year, when we, when, when council gave the authority to raise the heights mm -hmm. in the Deardon Station area. They directed us to study and explore an incentive zoning program for the Deardon Station area. And the intent of that is to explore exactly the issue that you're raising, Kathy. Mm -hmm. So for, for Google, we have the specific DA mechanism. But what about the other developers in the station area, whether it's of residential or other office, industrial, commercial, they stand to benefit from the increased heights also. So we, we are exploring that. We're doing the feasibility analysis. It's dependent on the capacity question of like, where our heights gonna be raised by how much. But we intend at that study session in April to report back to council about the capacity of putting some program in for the rest of the Deardon Station area so that if, if they are getting additional height, should they be expected to contribute something, right, over and above paying um, inclusionary housing requirement on additional units or over and above paying a commercial impact fee on additional square footage? Is there room to have some other sort of benefit coming back to the community? Or would doing that disincentivize height, right? So that, that's the kind of analysis that we're doing. Because we also don't want to um, preclude or put barriers up to developers going as high as possible. Uh, uh, understood, but I guess one of the one of the other thoughts that goes through my mind is um, city council is always weighing decisions on forgiving fees for for the development of 20-story high-rise buildings. Um, and so will there be um, 
a, a fair look at capturing some of that additional value when council currently commonly discusses reducing fees. Yeah, you're right. So we've projected for the next um, foreseeable several years that high-rise residential is infeasible in the downtown, that the, your costs of constructing an average high-rise compared to the rents that are going to be gained, it just does not pencil out. So it's kind of an interesting question, well, how, if it doesn't pencil out in downtown now, how might it pencil out in the Deardon Station area if in the future? What right. would have to happen to rents or construction costs in order for it to be feasible? It's an interesting and fair uh, question, and that's something that we're, we're looking at. Okay, thank you. Harvey Darnell, uh, North Wilgan Neighborhood Association. I, did I get a start? You got it, you nailed it. Okay. Uh, I'm also wearing a hat as a, a board member of uh, San Jose Parks Advocate. And I have looked at the plans and, and they're kind of nebulous and I see green spots and what have you. But I, when I talk to a lot of the park staff, they don't quite understand, and also planning staff, they don't necessarily understand where we are really going to have the additional parkland in this area. And I'm concerned that some of the parkland may be publicly, uh, privately owned, publicly accessible spaces, and that that becomes a po potential if, I heard a, um, uh, uh, on the internet last, uh, yesterday, that Jeff, Z uh, uh, um, Google, uh, Bezos gave a lecture to all his his employees that Google could, uh, not Google, excuse me, uh, Amazon. Amazon could potentially go bankrupt. And that, uh, that companies uh, in the, this age are only around for 20, 30 years. And, and you know, and he, it was a pep talk to get them to be customer friendly, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But it got me thinking that, you know, I love Google. But Google could have some issues, and you know it could be coming out of DC. They may break them up. I mean, you know, all kinds of things could happen. And if we have publicly, uh, privately owned, publicly accessible parkland as part of this agreement, I want to make sure that it doesn't become a land bank for some other entity later that can then just sell it off since the city of San Jose won't have title. So what can we do to make sure? that anything that is potentially green on the map, who, no matter who owns the title and who does the maintenance, is, uh, continues in perpetuity f as parkland. Harvey, Nancy again. Um, I want to let you know that the leadership, I'm not who, sure who you're talking to at Parks, but I'm, sorry? I'm not sure who you might be chatting with at Parks, but um, Parks staff is very, very clear on several different scenarios that could meet the Quimby Act and the baseline requirements. And, and plan park staff has begun to formulate um, what an ideal park situation would be. So I, I just wanna make sure you know that there are, is a lot of thought going into that from the park staff point of view. Uh, and there's plenty of opportunities for that to happen in a multiple uh, uh, scenarios ways. And we definitely hear what you're saying about ensuring long term that everybody has access to Deardon and to green space, whether it become trail, whether it's um, plazas, Plaza. whether it's parks itself. So we don't know exactly what that answer is yet or exactly what the for mix and formulation is, but we understand the notion of having uh, what's with the community not be a short lived commitment. Thank you very much. We're going to go to Sandra, then we'll come back to you, Michelle. Hi, uh, Sandra Weber, Plant 51. Um, and, and just in looking at these timelines, I'm just wondering, because I see on March 18th that we have a topical uh, presentation or discussion about 
the transportation. So with the expanded scope of that and the studies, can you just, I'm, I'm trying to think about timeline because when we're looking at the dwindling opportunity for feedback, so when we, when we hear the results of the transportation study, I'm just hoping that that gives us enough time to give feedback if there's any amended or changes in transportation. Thanks. Thank you very much. There will be, is what I'm being told. <laughs> there will be. So we're going to go to Elizabeth and then to Jeffrey. Uh, Elizabeth Tim Hill from the San Jose Downtown Residents Association. Um, on the slides, I see that there's some city-led engagement where the city staff is always here. There are also some Google-led engagements. And one thing I noticed, and again, I don't know if this is something the city can apply a little bit of advice or pressure on Google. Uh, what I've noticed is that most of the engagement activities are run by the contractors, which may be fine, but there's always that feeling that the contractors can come and go, it's outsourced, that we're really not getting direct access to Google, and perhaps the real decision makers, I mean, perhaps they do have the, the power to do so, I don't know, but you know, there's always that feeling I'm not talking to any, or maybe a few people from Google, mostly just their contractors. Yeah, the, there is a lot of, of, of expertise that is needed to brought in to do a project like this, both on the city side and the Google side, but I can assure you there is a core set of Google employees like Ricardo and Ava who are probably here right now who are, um, you know, who are, who are there and who are guiding the effort and who are doing, you know, deep listening. I, I mean, I spot them when, and when I show up, so. I, I think just proportionally yeah. there are many yeah. more contractors than Google employees. Yeah, and the, um, Google has actually partnered with Lendlease. They're a developer, but also they're the ones leading the engagement. So a lot of times when you talk to Lendlease, they are just as much a part of this as Google, even though they don't have the brand <laughs> recognition that Google might. And, and I just want to correct, you can see the, the partnership there. So Ava is with Lendlease and Ricardo is with Google and they are joined at the hips and <laughs> in this community every single day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah uh, Jeffrey Buchanan with uh, Working Partnerships. Um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, Kim, thanks for uh, in, in December at the council meeting, um, you know, there were some questions from the community around uh, uh, how the community benefits process will play out and, and when we'll understand some of this uh, financial analysis, the commitment from your team to bring that forward uh, before the uh, April study session. Really appreciate that. Um, also appreciate the summary of, uh, of the pri your understanding of the priorities so far. I think uh, for us as working partnerships and, and some of our coalition partners in Silicon Valley Rising, you know, when we've talked with hundreds of residents across the city, it's pretty clear that, you know, affordable housing and addressing displacement is really, you know, the top priority and ensuring, you know, those kinds of uh, workforce development opportunities so people can have the better incomes to be able to continue to stay in the city and enjoy all the rest of the other uh, features of this development. Um, so uh, I appreciate the uh, 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 listening on, on those elements and, and look forward to the continued engagement. But a question on the uh, uh, the project features uh, kind of uh, uh, question. Um, so, what would you consider? Would you consider the uh, uh, in the planning <coughs> documents submitted so far uh, those items that are that are spelled out explicitly? Those are those are features, or or, or just trying to get an understanding for for those of us uh, what, with with what documents that are out there now. How do we kind of assess features based off of uh, the fact that uh, there are some specifics of the plan that will be coming forward in perhaps later iterations. And so as we try to understand what that baseline is of the, uh, uh, the project features, is there, I realize there's probably more art than science here, uh, kind of some way to articulate that to help us think about that. Yeah, I, I, yeah so I mean, there's the project description for the, for the EIR, which is the, the best description of what the project is. I guess I'm just making a general point that there are things that maybe it's subjective that are in the project that the public would think are a benefit. 
right? So the fact that there's a lot of retail in the project, um, the fact that these district energy use systems are going to be an entirely new model that may bring a certain amount of resilience uh, and climate smart benefits, Th those kinds of things that might be in the eye of the beholder, but I was just making more of a general general point. Yeah, and, and so similarly with, um, uh, say, the, uh, the features outlined in like the AB 900 application, I think that's kind of what you were alluding to with the district utilities and sustainability features. Those would be considered uh, project features. In your mind. Yeah, in the okay. sense that we're not requiring Google to do that. Google yeah. is, is voluntarily saying that we want to create these new models and we want to overachieve California's already and San Jose's already vi very high environmental standards, right? Yeah. We think that's a great thing. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, folks? Yes, Edward. Uh, Edward Salm, Shasta Hanshaw Park Neighborhood Association. Just wanted to give a brief a statement, uh, thank you for the presentation. One thing, this is obviously a lot of information, not only for the SAG members, but for the public to kind of absorb. If you want to find one document that comparatively briefly gets you a lot of that information at once, uh, Roslyn's memo from January 7th about the early referral that was actually presented at the HLC meeting yesterday, which was included in Lori's email to the SAG members and is, I believe, on dear.sj.org too. Yes, it's 64 pages, but it's not hundreds of pages, and it gets the vast majority of what people have been hearing here in one concise document. So that, I think, is a valuable re resource for people that want to be able to get some information without feeling overwhelmed. So especially, essentially, for maybe members of the public, that's a good resource to be able to find as well. Thank you for that, Edward. I mean, we recognize this is the most um, complicated project any of us have ever worked on in our entire careers. There are a lot of pieces that are interdependent um, that, that are coming together and, and need to come together. And so this team is working very, very hard to try to be good communicators and to try to distill a lot of complexity and um, kind of honor the fact that everybody wants to really understand this, but keep it as as clear as possible what we're doing here. And I want to give a huge shout out to Lori Severino um, and Dave from Plan to Place because the, the granules, I call them the color coded, the honeycombs for the projects and the different activities and all these communications activities and the website and the handouts. I'm getting positive feedback that's really helping people under, get their arms around what we're doing here and how it all relates together, so thank you. And if you ever have feedback on where we can do better, we, we really want it, because we're very, very committed to that. Definitely. Thank you very much, Kim. Any other questions before we transition to the next topic? I'm seeing none. So we're going to go ahead and transition now to the Deardon Integrated Station Concept Plan. And Liz is going to come up for that. Can everybody hear me? Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. I'm Elizabeth Scanlon. I'm the program manager for the Deardon Concept Plan. It's good to be here tonight to give you an update on what's been happening on our uh, station planning process. Um, so many of you may have seen uh, uh, over the course of the last maybe, I don't know, eight weeks or so, we, we've been out in the community doing a couple of presentations. It started at the Joint Policy Advisory Board in mid-November. And um, I just want to also make a note, I think Lori mentioned it, but I do want to give a little nod that if anyone is interested in the JPAB presentation or additional uh, material on anything I'm going to present tonight, because I, I am doing a bit of a summary presentation, we do have an online town hall that was a narrated kind of slideshow, and um, that was that's on the Deardon SJ website. Or the city's website um, for the December 3rd city council meeting has a fairly in-depth 120-something slideshow um, that if you're interested in any more information, there's a couple places on the website and on, online to check and check out. And I'm going to talk about some upcoming events that many of you may want to participate in. So with that, um, so we've kind of been through this before, but just a quick refresher, right? Four agency <coughs> partners who came together 
to co-create a plan for Deer Dawn because there's many intersecting um, capital projects happening, including BART and um, Caltrain's electrification and whatnot. And these four partners have formally entered into a cooperative agreement, so they are bound together in uh, doing this work to create an integrated project. And their goal is really you know, to create a vision for the future of the station, and we've talked about this many times over the last couple of, maybe the last year, about creating seamless transportation um, connections to have efficient movements through and to the station and creating a world-class destination for San Jose. So our touchstones throughout the planning process that we went through over the course of the last year or so, year and a half maybe, um, are shown here on the screen, which included um, creating a catalyst for design, um, multimodal great connections, creating a destination for San Jose. Um, so these are all items that we kept referring back to throughout the planning process to kind of help guide you know, the best options um, that, met, that hold the most promise to meet our objectives for the future vision of the station. And so kind of what has been happening, many of you have seen us present at this um, forum over the last year. We did uh, start last fall. I can't believe it was actually over a little over a year ago that we started. Um, we started with understanding ambitions, right? The par partner agencies wanted to know, sort of explore themselves what their collective ambitions are, as well as requirements and objectives. We talked a lot about options for different elements. So the tracks, the Caltrain and high speed and heavy rail corridor tracks, where the um, different elements would go attached to different configurations of the station itself. We did uh, go out into the community, I think in June, was it June? Gosh, last year seems so far away now. Um, it was last summer we showed a possible layout. So different combinations that sort of showed a spectrum of different trade-offs or benefits with the station. And over the summertime, we did um, continue to optimize layouts. And we um, have presented at the end of last year a concept layout. All throughout that process, I just want to note, we did a lot of community engagement and got a lot of feedback from the community to kind of affirm and course correct and, and guide and shape the planning process. And so we talked a little bit about, and these are terribly hard to read, I apologize that the colors are washed, but the big moves, what we call the big moves in the care parts, and you can see the northern rail alignment, the southern rail alignment, um, how those two uh, track corridors relate to the station location and the vertical position of the platform. So whether the platforms are at grade or whether they're slightly elevated. And then when you think about the kit of parts, how those big moves all fit together and then layer in the different kit of parts. So where the VTA bus and light rail and inner city buses go, um, where buck bikes and peds and all the um, access modes, little consideration over parking and how parking might work in the future. Um, as well as, it didn't show it on there, there's usually an airport connector icon, so we are considering the future of the air car, airport connector and sort of not to preclude that potential. So we presented what we call the concept layout. Remember, this is about Lego building blocks, so this is really about spatial organization of what the station might look like in the future or might, how the um, different modes are organized. And I want to point out on the image you're seeing here that the sort of dashed lines that look like a lid has been lifted off the station is really to just indicate illustratively a potential future station canopy. Um, we got asked that uh, during the course of the last round of outreach that we were out and people said, what is, what is that? Is that the canopy being really high in the air? It's just to sort of imagine the lid got lifted off so we can see inside the station. And it's going to get a little bit bigger, as Lori said earlier, to enable the capacity envisioned by the Caltrain and high-speed business plans. We will expand the footprint um, to five platforms and 10 tracks, which is a little bit wider than what it is today. And um, this layout we elected to go with, um, in fact, let me just scroll through, because I think we've got a slide for each of the major decisions we made. You can see the kid arts. Yeah, I'm all, I'll walk through this one step at a time. So one of the first decisions we framed in and asked for, uh, staff made a recommendation, we asked the four policy bodies to, to sort of concur with or accept as an elevated station concept. And so this is raising the station slightly up in the air. And we have a couple of images that are just to help you get a feel for what the idea of raising the station might feel like. So we're standing at West Santa Clara looking to the west, and this is what we might imagine elevated station tracks could feel like or look like as we're outside this SAP center. Um, so you can really see the corridor is visible through um, west uh, to, the, uh, to the west side of the Alameda, right? So we can now see through the tracks to the other side, um, connecting and enabling really good connections um, from the uses in the new development uh, to the east over to the west side residential areas. 
And if we're looking from San Fernando back towards downtown, we might imagine that when the station tracks are elevated, um, we have a very great view corridor down San Fernando Street, which we imagine could be the bike and pedestrian corridor and really become the activated um, kind of multi-use corridor for, for um, bikes, scooters, skateboarders, uh, pedestrians, and all those great things. And I will say on this image, just to note that we, we haven't completely figured out what will happen with White Street. This makes it look like maybe buses and such are gonna um, kind of be able to traverse under the guideway. We're still figuring out. This is very conceptual at this point. Lots of work to be done, but we're just trying to imagine what's the benefit of raising the tracks up in the air to the urban, to the urban experience, right? The next decision is station concourses oriented really to Santa Clara and San Fernando Street. Um, we really spent a lot of time in layouts last year looking at the different types of maybe having a single station entrance hall um, oriented in different locations. And we landed on really thinking that Santa Clara and San Fernando are very important corridors. Santa Clara probably is the most active with buses, cars, um, and lots of different multi-use um, multi-uses on that street. San Fernando, like I just mentioned, could become the more kind of pedestrian bike corridor. They're both kind of anchoring um, access to and through the station from downtown to the west side, and vice versa. And so we think it's important to have a station entrance, which you can kind of see are illustrated by the little black arrows um, on this image. And so if we anchor the station with two kind of main entrance halls uh, facing downtown and two facing the west side. We start to fill in the kit of parts around it. We can imagine that bikes and peds can be very conveniently located right out front of the, the San Fernando entrance. The BART station now has a very, very connect, uh, direct, sort of clear connection to the, the Santa Clara entrance. We can imagine that the VTA bus and light rail are oriented right out front and are easily accessible by both entrances. Um, we're still, again, kit of parts are things that we will continue to refine and develop over time. We'll be working quite extensively with um, not just the four partners, but the Downtown West plan to integrate these really well. I will say on the light rail, we envision that could go underground and combine the two stations that are sort of in the Deardon area into a single station oriented underground right out front. So when you walk off the Caltrain platforms or you, you come to the station, you could go down one level and easily catch your light rail train. Um, we're, we're still going to be looking into that over the next um, phase of work, but that's kind of the thinking now. And we are playing around a little bit with maybe how to use um, White Street in some way as a, as a corridor available to us. Could we connect through and underneath the new guideway structure? How can we utilize that space now that we've created by lifting the tracks up? Um, and then there's some um, placeholders in terms of uh, taxis, TNCs, and other uses. This, again, will get integrated better with our... our um, our partners in the downtown west plan we're still going to be working through kind of how the transportation network can really well integrate to, to serve and support the station but this gives us a framework now to sort of work from as we as we move forward through the planning and additional engineering and i want to just give a kind of an indication that Lori mentioned a couple of areas that we heard a lot of feedback and i constantly say to folks this planning process is going to raise a lot more questions than it answers. So we know that there's still going to be a lot of questions of how all this will work. And this is just giving us a good foundation to, to build from. Um, oh, and the airport connector, future airport connector. We don't want to preclude, preclude that. So the third final, the sort of third decision we framed up at the end of last year was a recommendation by the staff to maintain the track approaches generally within existing northern and southern rail corridors into um, and through Deardon Station. And just roughly, this is a, an overview of what that looks like. So it would stay largely within the Caltrain corridor coming from the north, from San Francisco into Deardon. Um, CMOF, the Caltrain maintenance facility, is contemplated to be relocated in this concept layout to some point south that will be to be determined. We need to study that. Um, and then going to the south, the, the um, rail corridor would largely stay within the Cal Caltrain-owned right-of-way it also is partly owned in some locations south of Tamian by Union Pacific. Um, and I want to just say on um, this, there is a, um, this was an item that in, let's see if my slides kind of indicate this, I guess. Um, we had a lot of debate over the track approaches in particular last month, and that was an area that the San Jose City Council in particular felt wasn't ready for a, an acceptance yet, so we will be doing an extensive city council study session on January 28th to further talk about the rail corridors. We did look at a I-280 viaduct option, and so 
This is a little bit of an advertisement to come to the study session where we'll present pretty extensively about the 280 and the existing rail corridor to provide more information to the community and have another sort of more robust dialogue. So um, just a quick recap on outreach. Again, we did a workshop on the big moves. We talked a lot about layouts and track alignments uh, in September. We did the JPAB update in November, virtual town hall that all led into the sort of policy body presentations. I will also say that because the council um, felt they weren't ready to accept our, our recommendation on the existing corridor, the other three partners also deferred that decision. And so um, all four partners are on the same page in terms of not feeling like we got to where we need to be in exploring the rail alignment. So those those decisions are yet to be made in terms of um, the final kind of outcome of the rail corridor. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to be doing a study session at the end of the, this month, in a couple of weeks, and so um, we'll be presenting more information. We did do a pretty extensive presentation at City Council in December, so if you want to check that information out, it's a good foundational piece. We'll we'll take that, we're going to have that again, but a lot of that information, and, and um, the council did ask us to bring back some additional information, so we'll have that in December, um, in the end of January. So in terms of next steps, so if we can imagine that um, we do sort of get to a space where we've got some general alignment over these three big decisions. Again, sort of raising the tracks, um, station entrances at Santa Clara and San Fernando and, and staying within the existing corridor, or a track alignment selection. Then the next steps in the concept plan will be to continue planning all the kit apart. So we have a lot of work to do to continue to work on the modal elements. Um, and that would include advancing conceptual design of track alignments, light rail alignments, all those good things. Um, but there's also a bit of work to do, and I think some folks on this body have asked in the past about program management and governance and funding and financing. Very, very important ideas that we need to work on in earnest in 2020. So we will be studying um, how best to organize the partner agencies to deliver this program and um, ultimately own, operate, maintain uh, uh, the facility in the future. So that will be a pretty significant work stream. And as part of that, we need to understand how we might fund it and ultimately um, finance it in the operation and maintenance phases as well. So um, we'll be working on that. And then what we really hope will come out of sort of the combined multimodal planning effort and the governance and funding studies is a roadmap for implementation. We're starting to see that Deardon is a complex program of projects, moving maintenance facilities, rejiggering a huge station, raising tracks, that's all very complex, multi-year infrastructure investment, and so we need to have a good roadmap for how we're gonna do that over time. And through all of that, we'll continue to um, engage stakeholders in the community, this body, throughout the process. So I know that was a very kind of brief overview, and I'm happy to take questions or receive any feedback. Great, thank you, Liz. Uh, as she mentioned, this is your chance now to give us any comments, suggestions, questions. A lot of great information being shared here tonight. Nothing? Is it all super clear? <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. Harvey, you were first to turn your card up. So we'll go Harvey, Kevin, then Edward. I didn't think I was going to get off that easy. Come on, Harvey. Harvey Darnell, <laughs> North Willow Glen Neighborhood Association. Um, <coughs> And all things of railroads. Yeah. Okay. And you're aware of the comments that I made in the council meeting and at the uh, disc meetings and all the other meetings that have attended on this. I'm really concerned that you've come to a decision as staff that you have to come because of whatever reasons that you have to come through the North Willow Glen, Gardner, and, and, and um, Gregory Plaza neighborhoods at grade. And that you are going to take currently what is about 52 passenger trains a day and in the, not in the near future, maybe get up to 200 and then eventually your projections are 450 trains through the neighborhood. I'm concerned that you're saying that you can sandwich this in very neatly and not lose much of Fuller Park, not have much effect on the houses on Fuller, uh, and you're saying that you'll have no effect on Jerome. Well, I'm here to tell you that the houses in Jerome are 20 to 30 feet from the track. There is very little right of way behind 
uh, to the north of the uh, uh, rail so that you would have to basically take most of those people's backyards, if not the houses completely, along about 30 houses or something like that, 35, whatever Kevin knows a little better than I. And I'm concerned that we have a lot of secondary units behind the houses that are not legal quite yet, but we've just passed an ordinance to uh, grandfather and uh, forgive uh, a forgiveness ordinance uh, to potentially bring those into um, legality. And they are low income housing. And we could potentially make the low income housing in our neighborhood totally unbearable because you would bring that many trains that close to their uh, uh, buildings. So I, I'm concerned that, you know, the, the pictures that you've shown along the way make it look really nice and, and, and will be no effects and yeah, yeah there, there's less noise from a, an electric train initially than a diesel train, but I'm concerned that like everything else in the Bay Area, for example, BART, BART was very quiet when it first started and then they let it go for 40, 50 years and now they're having to relay all the tracks because they didn't do proper maintenance along the way and they didn't have money for upgrade of the equipment. So I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to get a, another blight on this neighborhood. And this is a neighborhood that has suffered since the railroad came through in 1930, 32. And this was a neighborhood that the council just heard a presentation about a month ago about how this neighborhood was redlined because of that decision. And I can tell you, I know about that redlining because when I first bought in in 1983, my house didn't qualify for FHA uh, financing because they redlined the neighborhood. So I'm concerned that what we, now we've taken this neighborhood, <coughs> brought it up through the SNI process and all the other processes that have come along and 20 years of community work and we potentially would get another situation where this neighborhood gets redlined again. I, I, I hear you, yes. I think that it's important to say the partner agencies are concerned about effects on the neighborhood as well. As you know, and we've said that we want to not make it any worse and hopefully make it better. I would say there's a lot of technical background that we could get into tonight. I don't really have the slides for that. I hate to defer to the study session, but that's the whole point, is to sort of tackle what you're raising, Harvey, because those are good points about do we really think we can get that much train volume in the existing corridor and really do much to affect mitigating those effects? And we want to share our thoughts on that. And the council asked us a lot of questions about can we get all the trains out of the neighborhood? Can we get most of the trains out of the neighborhood? Can we do something to relieve the the, the concern, and so we're going to come with a fairly extensive um, presentation about answering, hopefully answering a lot of those questions and having continued dialogue on them. Is yeah. that okay for everybody for me to sort of say that much, and then we, we will be presenting more information at the January study session to kind of get into the details behind the differences that we see and how we might be doing that? And seeing that it ta has taken us 30 years from when we made the decision to bring BART to San Jose, yeah. that we, maybe 30 years, maybe even longer, yeah. to get it to downtown, to Deardon. I'm concerned that <coughs> all the people that are making the decisions and making the promises are not gonna be here. Right, that's To protect us. Concern. Yeah, sure, that's fair. Thank you, Carmen. I wanna just reassure you all that all these comments, Diana is quickly typing all these up. We're taking detailed notes as well, so this will all come back up to the summary as we move this meeting forward. Thank so we're gonna go to Kevin, then to Edward, then to Dan. Okay, um, two comments. One, just kind of piggybacking off of just what- Kevin, oh, sorry, real quick. Kevin Christman, Gardner Neighborhood Association, and an awful lot of things railroad, so like Harvey. Um, the first time I ran into uh, the railroad situation was when we were um, planning on possibly making a park out of Fuller Park uh, in the, S the early SNI days. That was back in 2002. 
and we actually met with some of the high speed rail folks back then, um, and they pretty much guaranteed us that we would never have any problems with them because they wouldn't take our parklands because the redevelopment agency didn't want to spend the money to make a park than to unmake a park. So um, I've been on this for a long time and been concerned about it. Uh, piggybacking off of what Harvey said, uh, um, it's not only what it, you're doing now, but it's future development as well, because if you get the trains going through our neighborhoods now, and then you decide to expand later on, um, it will obliterate uh, the park and the houses on both sides of the track. You don't, you're not gonna try and fool me on that one. Um, but my biggest beef tonight is on the one element here on uh, one of your slides, I think it's 69. Um, meetings with community groups. And uh, I attended a <clears throat> community meeting that was for the uh, Gardner uh, Academy, a parent-teacher group, which is largely uh, Latino, so the meeting was uh, bilingual, English and Spanish. And the presentation, uh, understandably, was not very... Uh, um, sophisticated because you weren't you were talking with people who had not run into the trains before uh, but the level of the presentation was I thought very disingenuous in so much that really uh, when you sh uh, the people who made the presentation um, went and went through the at grade proposal versus the aerial proposal the extent of the uh, explanation that they showed was uh, they showed this nice little picture of the Gardner Academy and they said well this is what it looks like now and if we do an aerial proposal uh, that goes out over 280 to 87 this is what you're going to see in the background of the school and uh, then they said well and if you do the um, at grade proposal you won't have this and that was pretty much it and they didn't say anything about the uh, additional noise, uh, the taking of possible properties, the um, construction uh, disturbances that would go on for the neighborhood or anything like that. It was all just this one visual thing where here you have this aerial thing, which doesn't look all that great, but that's something that can be designed better, I think. But, you know, there, so uh, you have to get some of your partner agencies to give a more balanced approach to um, how they come out to the neighborhoods and present things. Because if you don't have any level of sophistication on how to build railroads, then you see just two pictures, and one is of an aerial configuration behind a school and the other one doesn't have it, what are you gonna pick? You know, it's, it's not really a fair comparison. And uh, just wanna put you on note that we're watching you guys, and you got to do a better job on your presentations. Thank you for the feedback, Kevin. I think we already... Yes, yeah, so I was there. Um, it was a California High Speed Rail Authority presentation. Uh, they're meeting with a lot of community groups as part of their environmental justice analysis for the environmental. Um, so, Kelly, if you want to jump in on any of this, too. But um, So we hear you. I mean, we... I, I was part of a prep meeting to talk about that, and we just knew there was so much information to present, and we knew a lot of the people would be new to the project, and we decided the primary purpose of that, it was set up to be a high-speed rail project, so I was there to provide a brief introduction, and um, I was trying to work with the principal to figure out a time to come back where we could really dive into the things coming out of the DISC, the concept plan process, so it, that's still in the works, and so we should definitely figure out a time to make the space to go into the nuances, but they had a lot to cover and were focusing on what they needed for their project environmental review. And you know, we always are trying to balance giving the full picture of the complexity and all the different processes involved, and so a, sh a shout out on the concept plan probably felt inadequate, and so I, I hear you. Thank you, Edward, and then Dan. 
Uh, Edward Salm, Shasta Hanja Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, partially one of my comments is putting on my other hat as the chair of the city's Historic Landmarks Commission. We know with both the DISC and the Google project, it's two huge scope projects that have different timelines, and nowhere do those kind of overlap and conflict more readily than at Deardon Station itself. All of the Google renderings show Deardon intact. The concept layout and everything on DISC shows the depot gone. By definition, the slide 66, the one with the lid that she showed, the edge of the station is the edge of the Google property. Unless the depot gets moved onto Google property somewhere, the National Register Historic Station is gone. And that, it's been repeated before, and it's on the material that Laurie has presented previously. But by definition, that is both a city and National Register element that needs to be addressed. And related to that, two other places that it overlaps, as seen on 66, the place on that graphic where the buses are shown is actually a small street between some of the proposed housing and an office building on the Google property. So essentially, the bus stop would be a road between two Google Google buildings and the BART station, which some of the public comment made as well, would be beneath one of the Google properties right now. So how those all coordinate and function properly so that we aren't creating new last mile problems yeah. and new problems that take out some of the city's historic resources are something that I think we need to continue to pay attention to. Well, we agree. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Edward. Thanks for that comment. Dan. Dan Mounsir, uh, Alameda Business Association. I, I, I think we do really like the uh, elevated platform. I think it should allow some greater connectivity through the station than there would otherwise be. Um, maybe I, I missed it. I didn't hear. What actually is the timing yeah. of the station being done? And I know it, it involves things like lowering San Carlos and raising park and all sorts of What's do we have any sort of a guess of a budget and timing? <laughs> That's a good question, yes. Um, so I, I, have, I think we all acknowledge it's a multi-year, probably multi-decade project. Um, if I was pressed, I would guess in the 2030 to 2040 timeline would be when we could expect stuff to happen. Um, we are in the planning phase. We're on step two or three of a lot of steps. So the partners are, the, I think what I mentioned about the governance and financing work leading to a roadmap for delivery is a key element this year because there are a series of s things that have to happen to make the station work, notwithstanding integration with other development plans, but also major railroad infrastructure construction. So um, that is something we really want to tackle this year. And part of doing that and understanding how we would build it and in what sequence, we need to know who and how we're going to pay for it. So we're going to do a lot of work on that in the coming, I, I would say year, but I think, as we know, these projects are big, and it'll take us a while to kind of get our arms around that. It's also a multi-billion dollar program. Um, we have some cost estimates in the in the high billion, you know, billions range. We need to um, put our pen to paper and refine those and come up with some numbers that we feel confident um, on. The conceptual engineering behind it is still conceptual. So again, we'll be doing a lot more work on the program development work over the course of the next year or so. So we'll we'll keep you informed as that takes shape. And so um, your question, Kevin, reminded me that we did make a flyer for the study session because we do want to make sure to help you all and help us get the word out. Um, and it'll be an important time to go through all this. So we have a few more copies. Uh, pick them up. We'll also uh, send a link or, or at least put it on the website. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, thank you. Jeffrey. Yeah, hi, Liz. Uh, Jeffrey Buchanan, Working Partnerships. Um, I feel like you may have already answered this, but um, uh, a few months back when, when VTA was submitting its uh, uh, kind of a wish list to the FASTER Coalition and thinking about what the agency would like to see funded for uh, uh, that potential transportation mega measure. Um, it was, obviously, it was a very back of the napkin. It seemed to be a very back of the napkin approach, but it, it had a, a line item for five billion dollars for, and they lumped together a future airport connector, uh, the the Dearden uh, 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 multimodal uh, project, and I think the the West San Carlos uh, Stevens Creek uh, possible connector. Uh, like what any. Is, uh, obviously, you guys are still crunching all the numbers, but anything uh, in terms of like the unfunded portion of uh, 
what uh, initially you're looking at with the disc so far of, of what what kind of additional public resources need to be raised in addition to like RM3 and all the other kind of mm -hmm. pots of money coming together so far? Anything of like terms of scope to help us mm -hmm. understand what that looks like? Yeah, that's a that great, that's a really great question. And um, so I think to start the BART program, as you all know, is, is almost over the finish line in terms of its funding plan. We're headed for a, a federal funding grant um, in the near term. And so I would say the BART facility, the head house, that sort of investment is almost there if we can get our federal partners to close the deal, so to speak. In terms of kind of Caltrain electrification is a funded under construction project. Um, California High Speed Rail is moving forward in their project development process, so funding is being actively discussed in the high speed rail investments. I think everything else regarding Daredon in terms of relocation of SEMA off, raising the station, doing all these improvements, that is not funded in any way. Um, not for environmental clearance, not for construction. So we do have a bit of fundraising to be done. I think the question the partners are really interested in exploring is um, what sources of funding are out there that are both transportation and maybe other, because we have some city building components to that. We don't know what that might look like. And then is there any opportunity for any kind of public-private um, investment or anything that's kind of innovative fin funding or financing or maybe other really interesting transportation and trans um, um, city building type mechanisms. We have work to do to that. So I would say really quite a bit of it is unfunded at the moment and we have, um, we've got to figure out how we're going to um, have a lot of bake sales and car washes in the next 10 years to fund. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, the point is we, we do have a, a way to go. And th thank you for pointing out about faster. There, there's been definitely some attention at the regional level, which is great on the Deardon program as a priority. And so we're seeing that MTC and folks are are definitely tracking this and are involved. And I think even on the state level, a lot of visibility on a uh, project that I think the state con considers a statewide significant program in the state rail plan, which is helpful. It's on the it's on the radar for the right people, right? Great, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other nameplates out. A few of you haven't had a chance to speak tonight, just wanna give you the opportunity. Jonathan, Reverend Ray. Jason, any other comments you'd like to share before we move to the public comment section? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Liz. So with that, we're now gonna transition to public comment. <coughs> and just a reminder, if you haven't had a chance to yet, to please hand off a, a uh, comment card. And this definitely is not your only opportunity. There's, you can go to the website and give us comments through that, through email, through platforms there as well. But with that, we're going to get going with Paul Soto, uh, followed by Catherine Hedges. And we do have a traditional time clock, two minutes up front. So if you could please try to adhere to that, that would be great. Good evening. My name is Paul Soto. Uh, I was born at Valley Medical Center. I grew up in the Horseshoe, which is the area that you're talking about right here. And to Harvey's point and Mr. Uh, Kevin's point, the, uh, the uh, houses to the north of those tracks have been given historical landmark status. All the ones that are in the Horseshoe, not. Mexicans are on the Horseshoe side, whites are on the other side. This is from Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World. Many historians, many sociologists and psychologists have written at length and with deep concern about the price that Western man has had to pay and will go on paying for technological progress. They point out, for example, that democracy can hardly be expected to flourish in societies where political and economic power is being progressively concentrated and centralized. But the progress of technology has led and is still leading to just a concentration and centralization of power. This was written in 1931, and he's talking about this. He knew what we, he knew that a Google meeting like this was going to happen. You know, so I mean, to talk about it like as if this is like uh, like some new you know thing that's going on that people couldn't predict. That's that's out. That's false. It's 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 just not true. I grew up in that neighborhood, man. And the red line that was mentioned here. That was, that was, there was the discrimination that's went on here, the segregation and the marginalization of Mexicans and the exploitation of child labor that built the entire infrastructure of this city that made it attractive to Google in the first place. That hasn't been tabled. 
So, I mean, in, until, in, in, I would suggest anybody to read The Devil in Silicon Valley, it was written by Stephen Peaty, and he gave a study session about a month ago, and on February 13th, he's going to speak again at uh, City Hall regarding these redlining issues. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, next we have Catherine Hedges, followed by Blair Beekman. <coughs> Catherine is God. Okay, so Blair, you're up. Followed by Laura Diaz. Hi. Uh, to begin, I feel an elevated rail line that serves only high-speed rail and that hugs the freeway systems through San Jose can environmentally and aesthetically uh, be satisfying and work very well. Please continue to be aware and, uh, and consider uh, a Merced to Tracy line or a second express line from LA to Tracy with a BART line from Tracy to the Bay Area and the use of the ACE rail. Be sure to talk about with BART officials as these ideas can offer interesting public transit options and not take away as many homes along the SF Peninsula. I hope in 2020 in Santa Clara County, uh, after years of studying good ideals and sustainable practices, I feel we are at our time to help begin important new standards in what can, one can expect from the near future in working and planning with the City of San Jose and Santa Clara County. To be able to speak of human rights and civil protections and daily practices should be open, friendly, and not considered hostile or too elite to talk about in 2020. Housing can begin to try to consider very low income, extremely low income, and mixed income as more open, regular thought, uh, dialogue, and goals. Worker rights, women's rights, local community energy, health care for all, and ideas of better openness, accountability, and good public policies with technology, surveillance, is slowly moving forward. These are ideas that have been very much developed over years of how to now address shock doctrine, disaster capitalism practices, and their ideas of continual war. Uh, from these sorts of practices, I hope there can be a very positive ERI, ER, EIR report process with HSR and that will work to address the future of fossil fuel, transportation, and the dreaded questions of eminent domain uh, in open, decent, and humanistic terms. With five seconds, uh, please consider uh, how to better talk about environmental issues in San Jose in the future. We can do a much better job with that. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Next, we have Laura Diaz, followed by Larry Ames. Um, this is a little bit over two minutes, so I hope you can indulge me. My name is Laura Diaz, and I've lived in San Jose for 47 years, and I'm a lifelong resident of downtown San Jose. For those of you not from San Jose, it may be easy to dismiss the history, resiliency, culture, beauty, and community that makes San Jose what it is today. For those of you coming to San Jose looking at our city like some unclaimed, newly discovered land to be stolen and taken over again, those of you that, quote, want to make it better, which sounds very similar to let's make it better again, Rings of privilege, arrogance, and violence. You are not here to make it better, you are here to break it. Last night in this room during a commission meeting on historic preservation, a couple of Google staff talked at us about building, quote, character zones in their proposed plan and added we wanted to be the heart of San Jose. Well, San Jose already has character, San Jose already has a heart, and it doesn't dwell in soulless, generic, fabricated buildings that Google wants to force upon us. The heart of the city are the hardworking people that have been here for generations, a lot of them that are not here today because they're working. You never talk to the people of San Jose. The heart of San Jose is the gente. Like colonizers long ago, you set sail towards San Jose, your eye on the prize, and you found the shores of City Hall, the type of leadership that you needed. The corrupt city leadership willing to sell out their people and their city. The culture and history, you were offered the keys to the city without even a peep hidden behind non-disclosure agreements, fake promises of community benefits, and the promise of a shiny new buildings and housing for your benefit. You set up fake community engagement feedback sessions and took note of only what you wanted to hear, dismissing the voices of people of color, women, the elderly, our LGBTQ community, our youth, our unhoused brothers and sisters, and instead listened to the greedy developers who are the heart of gentrification. You claimed at countless meetings to be transparent and have open dialogue, but talking at people is not this. Instead, when community members did not stand up to your deception, you attacked by ignoring our message that we don't want you here. 
the people of San Jose are saying, San Jose no se vende, se ama y se defiende. And when we try to protect our city, we are criminalized, arrested at public city hall meetings, threatened, kicked out of public community meetings. There has been an intentional and blatant disregard for the people in this community that are struggling every day. We don't want your lies, your fake promises, like the ones you made long ago to the hardworking people of Mountain View and countless other communities that you took over. At last night's meeting, you said you want to bring culture to San Jose. You don't know what culture is. Culture isn't a, pure, a mural you pay Google to, to paint in downtown to brighten it up. It's the murals that are disappearing every single day in the city. Somebody at the meeting last night said, well, maybe we should put a plaque or a statue in the proposed development so people can remember the history of San Jose. There is already this assumption that there is a need for a reminder of us. We are still here. But even this commissioner saw that with this project, the people of San Jose, the storytellers, the artists, the builders, the workers, our youth and our elders are already expected to be gone and replaced with a nice plaque. A plaque can't tell you the story of the city. What you want to do is simple, claim the land, erase those that have toiled it, and bury un us under those plaques. The money that will be spent funding new initiatives that you're giving to these nonprofits, it's going to run out. And you will have to look at yourself and see what side of history you were on. Google is not San Jose's savior. Our community is. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we have Larry Ames followed by Bill Rankin. I know, how this one, I know how this one works. So yes, I come to echo what uh, Harvey said and also Kevin and Ed, and I feel like I've been saying the same thing for all these different meetings, but it's, I guess it's a new audience. So uh, um, please um, use the, trail align the rail alignment that goes through the 87 to 80 alignment. Uh, stay out of the neighborhood there and stay within the freeway right of way. I mean, they're planning on having 400 and some trains a day through this area here. I mean, people bought their houses knowing that there was a track next to it, but those houses, I mean, those, when they bought their houses, they had a few trains a day. Now you're planning with the electrification and uh, high-speed rail and everything, it's 400 trains a day. I hope you can do the alignment. I hope you can have um, freight trains go on the same alignment through the freeway interchange. That would solve the problems of the flyover and the crossing of the tracks and so forth. If you can get all the tracks on that thing, the bridges have to be designed to be a little more sturdy to carry the weight, and there are some issues about the uh, grade that the thing can go on. So maybe I'm not sure how important it is, how complicated it is to do it, whether it is just you have to redraw a drawing and raise it station by a foot or two or if it's really serious. I'd like to see the plans. I understand it's going to be before City Council in a couple days. I really want to see if you can get the, high, the uh, freight trains through the freeway too. That would really help the area a lot. That would also free up the old current alignment so you can make a high line trail out of it. It would be quite an uh, attraction for the city there. Uh, let's see, point five. Uh, make sure you have the connection shown to the airport. I mean, on your maps, you show the existing lines, but it does not show the connection to the airport. I found out the hard way. If the line is not shown on a map, it doesn't get built. So all the nice words are very nice, but you need the thing there. I echo the statements about the historic preservations and preserve and reuse the buildings. And please, yes, keep the Deardon Station. It's a historic building. Uh, the parks and trails connections. This is how people will be able to get to the station. You don't want people driving to the station all the time. You want to be able to Take the trails there. Uh, Harvey was talking, he was trying to say Popo. Let's see, where'd Harvey go? Anyhow, Popos, that's uh, privately owned public open spaces. And uh, um, yes, it's Google, good that Google is planning on some of these things. Um, I like Google. I also like Netscape, Yahoo, and AOL, but they're not around any, long, any longer. And uh, I worked at the largest company in the city, in the county at the time, but it's almost all gone too. So that uh, you need to have the plans, whatever arrangements are made for the popos that they'd be independent of who owns the land. I mean, Lockheed owned half the city at one time and now it's a few buildings. So you make sure that the plans are, no matter who owns the land, it stays there. So parks stay there. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We have Bill Rankin followed by Patricia Palomares Mason. Thank you. I'm uh, Bill Rankin. I live in um, North Willow Glen. I too wanted to echo what Harvey and Kevin said so well. The impacts of an increase in train lines through the Greater Gardner neighborhoods will have big effects 
on neighborhoods that have been so severely impacted by transportation advances over the years. Adding a third line through the neighborhoods will have devastating effects on the park and to the houses on Jerome. Adding even more lines would cause even bigger problems. I understand that grade separation has been thought through for Azurai. This is a good thing. This will keep trains from stopping vehicle traffic, and the train horns will stop there. But I understand grade separations at West Virginia have not been figured out yet. That would need to happen, or the train horns will drive people crazy. And by your own estimates, train traffic will increase from the 50 to 60 trains a day now to over 400 a day. That is especially um, unfair to historic neighborhoods that have already been so impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we have Patricia followed by Jean Dresden. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge each person that is sitting up here at SAG. And the reason why I want to acknowledge you, because you are the voice of San Jose. You're the voice of those homeless. You're the voice of many levels of lives of people, our seniors, our elders, our children, our children that are the future. You're making a big impact on the future. Whether our children are not here, whether our elders are not here. And that impact that you're going to do, say, ask, question, or why is it happening this way? Or how much is it costing? But the most important part that you're forgetting, to take care of our people of San Jose. You're forgetting that. That people that walk, they don't drive. Those elders that are in a wheelchair. Our children that don't have school are not getting fed. So you being here Maybe those people don't know who are the voice for them. So you got to touch your heart. You got to hear more to your communities. You got to listen and make sure what the questions are asked are getting answered. But not just for right now to be in that meeting because you're not going to be here 40 years. I have a grandson. He's a fifth generation living at Gardner. He's been here at these meetings. He's a first grader, and he asks me, why do we come to these meetings? Because you are my future, and I have to make sure I try my best. But are those people trying their best, Mama? I don't know. How can I ask them? I'm not the only one here. I'm not the only one at Garner School. And exactly when they came to that meeting, 30 minutes, a presentation. Parents couldn't ask questions. It wasn't enough time because it was a coffee time with the principal. I made sure I walked with those people around our neighborhood. I made sure they were aware where their impact was going to be on our kids, on our seniors. Gardner just lost a senior, 105. Gardner has been a seat for different things. Gardner in the early 60s was the first Gardner advisory. We were the first ones to make sure we were impacting our communities by having a swimming pool for our kids because a lot of our parents couldn't take their kids swimming because they were working in the canneries. We wanted to make sure there was something for us. And that swimming pool is there now. So Gardner has a lot of history, exactly like our people, not just in Gardner. All of San Jose is going to be impacted. So I ask all of you, touch your heart. Think. Do you go at night thinking, did I ask the right question? Am I communicating to my community? Am I asking? Am I doing a survey? And what am I doing if I'm sitting at this table? Do I just come here and pretend? No. Go out there. I work. I have a husband who has cancer. And he was only told to live three months. And I'm here. 
I have a grandson that I have to make sure I take care of too. And I'm here, and I still communicate, and I still went and walked my neighborhood. And nobody's paying me. I'm living in Gardner, but I'm not on just living in Gardner. I live the east side, the west side, the south, the north, because I go to every direction. Every community is important in San Jose. But you are forgetting to care about the people of San Jose. No matter what the race, no matter what the age, no matter what the income is, there is a need. Those homeless out there are dying. Yesterday there was a fire by 85 because they were trying to keep warm. See, there's things that you don't see early in the morning. So go out in your communities, find out your people, ask questions, ask them to say, what can I do better? Yeah, you don't get paid, but you're here representing them. Don't forget that. Thank you, Patricia. I believe our last speaker is Jean Dresden. Good evening, my name is Jean Dresden, and since so many people shared their background, I'll share mine. I was born here, and my folks were here before that, and my grandfolks were before that, though they kind of moved in and out of town. So I'm wondering, as we talked about various things, if anyone has actually talked to the folks who own the properties on Jerome. I have, not everybody, but I go over and visit and we talk and one of the first reactions is, is they still talking about doing something there? Because they think high speed rail's gone and they haven't heard about it. And so, uh, and they don't think that they're at risk or at least a couple of folks I talked to and so when we talked about the sound, possible sound wall, they wondered about, well, how's that going to fit in there without you coming into my property? Are you going to just bring construction equipment in there? And I'm wondering, high-speed rails uh, attitude is if they have to construct on property, they take the parcel, and then they subsequently salt it. Well, if this is a Caltrain project, then is there just access to the parcel, or are you taking it? and then reselling it. And that's a very different kind of impact. And I don't know. They don't know either. Do you know? How do you build a sound wall without getting access to those properties? Many people complain, you know, they bought, people bought property next to the train they should have known. Well, back in the 1940s, at the peak of trains, there were only 90 trains a day, passenger, milk train, postage tra and trains, freight and you're going to go four times as much, more than four times as much. How could they have ever guessed that, even if they were wise enough to know what it was like at the peak in the 1940s? Then I'm thinking about Fuller Park, and I made a comment to DOT management that it's a sin, the simulation picture that was shown that minimized the impact of Fuller Park, and the new artwork needs to be done that shows that more accurately. And compensation needs to come forward about the loss of active recreation. And then finally, a little bit about Google. When we go through, it'll be very interesting to see the exact computations about parks, park lands, community benefits. And again, POPOs as a community benefit, considering they're only temporary for as long as those buildings or that corporation stands and agrees to provide public access. These are real considerations. It's a complex situation, but let's not just get lost in the green space saying, oh, pretty. It's only really pretty if we really have access permanently. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. We do have one last speaker, Brian Jesus Peraza. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Jesus Peraza. I came to San Jose as, um, as a student here at San Jose State from Orange County. Um, initially, I was intending to just stay here for my two years because um, uh, I was a transfer student and then headed back. However, um, when I stayed here, I got involved with a lot of the communities here, uh, a lot of the groups here in the community, and I was really inspired and touched by the folks here and about how much they care about the, their community. Um, a lot of them, they um, devote a lot of their time to spreading um, the message about what's going on with Google, about how it's going to neg negatively impact the, the community and San Jose as a whole. And uh, I'm just 
here to um, hopefully bring some light to um, some of their concerns because a lot of people, they um, think the same things and um, they, I'm sure they wish they could be up here, but a lot of them are working, they're taking care of their, their kids, their families and whatnot. Um, and I just hope that you all find it in your heart to really show some compassion and take into consideration that a lot of people are concerned about their future here in San Jose. They won't be able to afford to live here anymore. Their kids won't be able to grow up here. Um, it's just, you, you're, you're not just talking about a, a company in, anymore. You're talking about people's lives and people want to spend their life here. People, have, they have roots here. They, they've been here for generations and they had intentions to keep doing that, but now Google's gonna disrupt that and it's gonna force them to go elsewhere. They're gonna have to start all over again. And I, I just think that's really unfair. Um, and hopefully some of you can speak out against that and not let that happen because I, I myself, I, I, I'm, I'm leaving soon. I'm gonna go back to my family because I have roots somewhere else where hopefully I could grow up and raise a family. And I just wish, I wish my friends and the people in the community had that opportunity too because it's not cool that some company like Google could just come in and rip that away from people. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so just again, as a reminder, if you didn't want to speak here tonight but have comments, there's a comment box in the back. You could definitely provide comments through the website, and we'll make sure that that voice is also heard in the summary that's put together for this meeting. And uh, I'm going to turn it now over to Lori to talk through next steps. Yeah, uh, just to emphasize, too, um, the s summaries from the last meeting and from the small group discussions were provided in your packet tonight. So we put draft on that because if you have any um, comments, questions, we will tweak it. We want to make sure that's reflecting uh, the conversations we're having. Um, hopefully you enjoyed Eda Pita tonight. That was mixing it up a little bit. Um, and if you have any other requests or suggestions for local businesses that provide reasonably priced and delicious catering, <laughs> send them my way. Uh, make sure to validate your parking. We have a new system downstairs. Sometimes they leave the gates open after 8.30, but that's not happening anymore. I learned the hard way. Um, and so if most of you do this al already, but if your representatives change over time, just make sure to send the contact info, email, phone. We'll be sending uh, around an updated contact list to just verify that we are getting the emails to the right people. Um, it can be uh, anyone in your organization that needs to just get these updates. So um, yeah, and s this is just a reminder of what our intent is for the next uh, meeting on March 18th. Um, and also, it's not reflected here, but uh, we mentioned that we'll come back with more information on the development capacity for the Deardown Station area plan and where that's uh, headed. Um, okay, I think that's it. So I'll adjourn, 8.32. Thank you. <laughs>